aren't you glad Jesus saves? Amen. Amen. Take your Bible this morning, if you would, please, for our scripture reading. First Thessalonians. First Thessalonians, please. Chapter 1. First Thessalonians, chapter 1. We are going to read verses 6 through 10. First Thessalonians, chapter 1, and verses 6 through 10. We read the verses responsibly. We begin together on verse 6, then I'll read verse 7. We'll alternate like that till we read through verse 10. And as our custom is, let's stand together to read the scripture. All of us standing, please, to read God's word. And let's begin together on verse 6, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Ready? And ye became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost so that ye were in samples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to Godward is spread abroad, so that we need not to speak anything. For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you. How ye turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. And let's pray, shall we? Father, add your blessing, please, to the reading of the scripture here this morning. We thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you, God, for preserving it for us, and that we hold copies in our hand this morning. And Lord, I'm praying that You will continue to make our hearts ready, that we'll be prepared to receive the truth from your word today. Lord, help us to focus, uh, draw our attention now to you, and Lord, help us to have ears to hear what you want to say to your church this morning. Bless the special to that end, in Jesus' name, amen. There's a lighthouse on the hillside that overlooks light sea. When I'm tossed, it sends out a light that I might see. And the light that shines in darkness now will safely lead us o'er. If it wasn't for the lighthouse, that ship would be no more. And I thank God for the lighthouse. I owe my life to him, for Jesus is a lighthouse, and from the rocks of sin. He has shown a light around me that I could clearly see. If it wasn't for the lighthouse, where would this ship be? Everybody that lives about us says tear that lighthouse down the big ship don't sail this way anymore there's no use of it standing round then my mind goes back to that stormy night when just in time i saw the light Yes, the light from that old lighthouse that stands up there on the hill. And I thank God for the lighthouse. I owe my life to him, for Jesus is the lighthouse, and from the rocks of sin, he has shown a light around me that I 
could clearly see if it wasn't for the lighthouse where would this ship be if it wasn't for the lighthouse tell me where would this ship be Father, we bow before you in prayer now. We thank you, Lord, again for the opportunity we have to look into your word together. And I'm praying, God, that you'll minister to our hearts today as only you can. Lord, we need to hear from you today. We thank you already for the good music and <clears throat> the good testimonies we've heard this morning. Father, I pray now that you'll help each one of us to focus and concentrate. And Lord, I pray that your spirit would be free to minister to your people this morning. Please help me as I bring the message to be clear and to be easy to be understood. Lord, I pray that you will do what only you can do in the hearts and lives of people here this morning. Lord, meet with us. May your will be done in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> First Thessalonians is the, as we talked about in Sunday school this morning, it is the first letter of all of Paul's epistles. I think Paul wrote half of the New Testament and uh, was a human instrument to write half the New Testament. And 1 Thessalonians is the very first letter that he was penned. And if you, to, to find out about the beginning of the church, you read about it in the book of Acts chapter 17. <clears throat> there was much opposition there. They had a good start. People were saved and added to the church, both men and women. And then those who didn't believe got upset. And they really caused a riot in the city and so much so that Paul and Silas had to leave and go to the next town over, which was Berea. But in that short time that he ministered there to the church in Thessalonica, they became an example church. They became what, what we could call a model church. Uh, I, <clears throat> when I think about that, I think about the lady who come up to her pastor and said, you're just a model pastor. Well, he kind of thought that was pretty cool. And he thought that was good until he looked up the word model in the dictionary. And then when he looked at the word model in the dictionary, it says a small imitation of the real thing. <laughs> so when I say a model church, that is what we're talking about, okay? And uh, this is a pattern church, maybe. That would be a better way to put it. Uh, a church that we could pattern ourselves after. And by the way, the pattern for a New Testament church is always the Word of God. Uh, the pattern for a New Testament church is not tradition, it's not denomination, it's not Madison Avenue, it's not whatever works, it is the Word of God. Uh, th this is not, see, say, well, what, what do you think the church should be? Listen, it's not a matter what we think the church should be, this is God's church. Christ is the head of the church. And so you and I don't have a say in what, what we think the church ought to be. Uh, God's already told us what it's supposed to be. We just have to follow the pattern. Okay, We follow the pattern of what God's laid down for us. And the, the people here, the believers in Thessalonica, were not just defenders of the faith, they were demonstrators of the faith. And they demonstrate for us what a church ought to be. And I want to look at this church this morning as a pattern church. And notice several things about them today. Number one, I want you to notice it was a saved church, a saved congregation, if you will, all right? Notice verse 10. They, they, were, they, were to waiting, they were waiting for His Son from heaven, whom He raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Notice verse 1. Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus under the church of the Thessalonians, which is in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be to you in peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice they're in Jesus Christ. When they're in Christ, notice verse 10, they're saved from the wrath to come. Okay, We're, we're saved from the wrath. The Bible says when you do not believe in Christ, the wrath of God abides on you. You are under the judgment of God. 
You've been delivered. When you put your faith in Christ, you've been delivered from that. Not will be delivered. You are delivered. It's past. It's a done deal the moment you put your faith in Jesus Christ. And so these people are saved. When you're in Christ, that's a Bible term for being saved. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things pass away. Behold, all things are become new. And so what, what happened is all of your sin was laid on Jesus Christ. All of my sin was laid on Jesus Christ. And He died for us. He took our place. God committed His love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Alright, so He took our place. All my sin was put on Christ and He became sin for me when He knew no sin. When I put my faith, when you put your faith in Jesus, all His righteousness, all His perfectness gets put on our account. And, and we go to heaven because God sees us as perfect. Because He sees us in Christ. And so we get to heaven not on our righteousness, but on His righteousness. Because we put our trust in Him. And God imputes that righteousness to us. He calls that justification. He calls it justification. Just as if we had not sinned. Okay? And we're justified in the sight of God. And, and so... You cannot belong to the church of Jesus Christ unless you are saved. It's always a saved membership, a saved and baptized membership. In fact, hold your finger there in 1 Thessalonians 1 or put a piece of paper there. I don't think you can take your finger off and put it in there. So just uh, put a piece of paper in there if you will. And then look at Acts chapter 2. Would you turn there please? Acts chapter 2. Acts 2, as you know, is Pentecost. The, the, the power of the Holy Spirit has come upon the, the 120 in the upper room and they've preached the gospel to people who are gathered together there out of every nation under heaven at the time, uh, there to Jerusalem, and they preached the gospel and, and many received the word that day. They received Christ. And the Bible says in verse number 41 of Acts 2, they that gladly received His word, so they were saved, then what happened? They were baptized, and the same day they were added unto them. Now, who's them? Them were the 120 that were already saved and baptized and had been praying in the upper room. They got added to them about 3,000 souls. So in one day, the church went from 120 in attendance to 3,120. All right? That's a pretty big day, isn't it? And uh, they were, but do you understand? They didn't get added to the 120 until they were saved and baptized, all right? When you're saved and you're scripturally baptized, you're added to the church. That's the Bible pattern. That's the Bible example. A saved, baptized membership. So the first thing I see as a pattern church is, see, you don't just join a church because I just like everybody here. Or you have nice programs, or I like your building, or I, you have a gymnasium, or whatever, you know, or I like your coffee on Sunday morning. You know, it, it, that isn't the reason you join a church. You join a church if you're saved and you're baptized. You come forward, I, I hope you do like the people here. I hope you do think the coffee's good on Sunday morning. But, but that's not the reason you join a church. You join a church, I'm, I'm going to ask you, have you received Christ as your Savior? And have you been scripturally baptized since you've been saved? And uh, if you have done both those things, then we can receive you into the membership of the church. If you haven't, we need to deal with that. And uh, you need to be saved and baptized to belong. Then, notice also in 1 Thessalonians, they were not just saved. Number two, now listen carefully, okay, they were converted. You say, wait a minute, I thought you said they were saved. I did. Uh, they were saved, and now they were converted. What does that mean? Let me see. Verse number 9. <clears throat> they themselves show of us what manner of manner in we had unto you, and how ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. So I see there they were converted. What does conversion mean? Conversion means a change of purpose. A change of purpose. It's a turning around or a changing of the use of something. Okay? Now, let me illustrate it. had a great illustration of this when I was in Bible college. The college I went to had, it was associated with a downtown church. Okay, had a large church building, but most, mostly 
it was spread out over several buildings. Sunday school classes and different ministries would be in different buildings downtown. And <coughs> there was one building right uh, adjacent to the church that was a sev- it was called the Seven Seas Lounge. Okay? And uh, you know what? It had, the church bought the building. Okay? Now, if you'd have went down to the title office and said, who owns that building there? You looked in the title and it said, the owner of that is First Baptist Church of Hammond, Indiana. But you looked at the building and guess what was still, the sign was still up on the building. You know what it said? Seven Seas Lounge. If you looked in the, the, the big plate glass windows there, there was still a bar in there and there were still bar stools sitting around there and, and, and tables. You didn't see anything different about what was in there, but it had a new owner. Why? They purchased it. It was, it was saved. It had changed ownership. But it wasn't converted yet. Pretty soon, you know what happened? Folks came in, started taking stuff out, took a sign down, put a new sign up, old stuff went out, carpeting came in, drywall went up, chairs came in, platform came in, a pulpit came in, and it became the Spanish auditorium at that time. And now it was converted to another use. Oh, they used to drink and do all kinds of stuff in there. Now the gospel is being preached in there. Folks are getting saved in there. Lives are being transformed in there. It's been changed to a different use. It has been converted. It's being converted to a different use. Listen carefully. Redemption in the Bible, the purchasing of us, is a work of God the Son. We've been redeemed by His blood. Okay? He's the one who purchased it. Justification, that thing we talked about where we're declared righteous in God's sight, that's a work of God the Father. He's the judge and He declares us justified in His sight. Regeneration is another word that, that the Bible uses for salvation, and that in Titus 3 5 says it's a work of the Holy Spirit. All three parts of the Godhead are at work in our salvation redeeming us, justifying us, regenerating us. But then you have this work of conversion. And I believe conversion is a work of the church of God by the Word of God. That's why it's important for the church to preach and teach God's Word. This is the only thing that's going to convert you, change you to a new purpose, change you from the lounge you were to a vessel to be used by God. This is what will do it. And so you come to church to hear the Word of God. Let me show you. Uh, Look at Psalm 19. Psalm 19. Are you okay? Psalm 19. Notice verse number 7 with me. Notice where the Bible says, The law of the Lord is perfect. What's it do? Converting the soul. Changing the purpose of of the soul, changing the purpose of what you're living for. What is it that changes us? It's God's Word. So when you come, what, what changes you is God's Word. That's why folks will tell you, you come to, listen, I'll guarantee you, you come to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, you do that faithfully, and you, you mark it down, you do it faithfully for six months, you will change. And, and that is because God will change you through His Word. Uh, The Word being taught, the Word being preached, the law of the Lord converts you. It changes you. You you can't help it. It, The Bible, Romans 12, 2, was written for our transformation. It's it's not just information. It's transformation. And so uh, he, he said, so can people, listen, people can be saved but not converted. Oh, the ownership's been changed. If you look, they they put their faith in Christ. But they haven't allowed the Word of God to convert them. They haven't allowed the Word of God to change their purpose, to change their life. And only the Word of God will do that. That's why why the best follow-up program for a new believer is to get into a good Bible-preaching, Bible-teaching church. 
and then be there Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Sunrise east, sets in the west, two plus two is four, water runs downhill. I go to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. It's just, just, just mark it down. Uh, there's never a decision has to be made. Just set it down. This is what I'm going to do because it will change my life. It will change my purpose. Uh, Jesus told Peter. Remember when Peter began to rebuke Jesus about that he was going to die on the cross and, and suffer things at the hands of sinners and be crucified. And Peter said, no. And Jesus had to say, get thee behind me, Satan. And then he said, Peter, I've prayed for you. And when you are converted, strengthen the brethren. Now, I don't think he was talking to an unsaved Peter here. I think he was talking to an unconverted Peter. Peter had not yet allowed Christ to change his life and be consecrated to God. See, it's the difference between Romans 10, 13 of whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved and Romans 12, 1 and 2 where you present your body a living sacrifice holy acceptable unto God which is a reasonable service. There's a difference between the two. And, and there's, a, there's a process of growth. So you want to, these, these folks, they didn't just, they didn't just turn, to, turn from idols. They turned to God to serve him. That's a conversion. See, that's a complete change of purpose in their life. And that's what God desires to do. Listen, that's why you can go, you can go to, Churches, and, and I'm not saying, I'm not putting a blanket over all, all of it, but because there can be people, even bible even churches, that don't get changed because they're not allowing the Word of God to penetrate their heart. Their, their heart is the stony ground, you know, and they don't want the Word of God to come into it. But, listen, if you don't teach and preach the Bible, then lives don't get converted. Lives don't get changed. And that's why folks don't grow. They can... Uh, listen, psychology isn't going to do it. You, you have to have the Word of God. And that's going to lead me into the third point here in, in 1 Thessalonians again. And that is not only were they saved, not only were they converted, but they were biblical. They were biblical. Notice, notice chapter 2, 1 Thessalonians 2, and look at with me at verse 13. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye receive the Word of God, which ye heard of us, Ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. Notice how they received the word. They received the word of God not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God. They received his word as this is God's authoritative word. I was talking this week to someone who goes to another church and they were just grieved about some things going on in their church and uh, part of their <clears throat> uh, worship team that didn't want to be in church. They're, leading, they're supposed to lead the worship in church and one of them says, uh, the, the pastor's wife thought that, well, if you're on the worship team, Brother Bob, they thought that you probably ought to go to be in church Sunday night and Wednesday night too, not just Sunday morning. And they were throwing a fit over that. Oh, no way. And the person who teaches the Wednesday night study, you know, they're just, one of them said, they just, they just teach the Old Testament. And I don't care about the Old Testament. I don't care about doctrine. I just want to hear about Jesus. These are your people leading worship in the church. See, what has happened? We've gotten so far away from being biblical. The Bible. You carry a Bible to church. The sign, don't get mad at me. The sign out there says Bible Baptist Church. Okay? So don't, don't get upset if I talk about the Bible. Okay? It is Bible Baptist Church. You ought to, you ought to carry a Bible. Hey, don't, uh, folks, folks watch. Folks see. D.L. Moody used to say if you, carry your, if you walk to church and you carry your Bible to church and you walk a mile to church, you preach a sermon that's a mile long. You're carrying your Bible to church. Folks, if they notice folks park and walk into the building, they ought to notice people walking, carrying their Bible. You're not going to have that testimony if you carry your smartphone. Okay? You're not going to mark the verse and write a note in there on your smartphone. Well, I know. That's, everybody's quiet. Don't bow your head. It's not time to pray. Okay? All right? Those are, hey, that's fine if you're... Uh, I, guy recently said he was walking in the park and it was getting kind of dark and he was in his walk and 
ran upon somebody and started talking to him, wanted to witness to him, and he had, because the phone lit up, he could show him the scripture on his phone, and he led the man to the Lord. Well, praise God, that's great, okay? But, but that isn't going to replace your Bible. It ought not to replace your Bible. I won't get started on that, but I uh, just about do it, all right? But you understand, they were transformed in just a short time. They, they were amazing the things that they learned and grasped and changed in just a few weeks' time that Paul was able to spend with them. Why? Because they received this book not as the word of man, not as what Paul's saying, but as the word of God. Can I tell you this one? What I say won't change your life. God's word will change your life. What the, what the church says won't change your life. What God says will change your life. No man can change you. No priest will change you. The Pope can't change you. The Baptist preacher can't change you. Only the book can change you. Talked about this morning when we listened to Brian's testimony there of reading the, the Bible for six months. You're, you're, you're very similar to Brother Messer when he was searching and he began to read the Scripture. And uh, every night, I think it was Romans and then John for him and reading that every night. What was it that did the change in their life? The Word of God. I remember the first time I talked to Brother Fred, and I said, well, uh, who led you to the Lord? He said, nobody. I'm like, what? You know, that's not possible, is it? You know, and he goes, well, somebody helped me. I said, well, tell me your story. And then he told me the story. You know what? It was just the power of the Word of God that showed him his need of Christ. And, and, and it, you, you, you receive God's Word. His, his drastic you think about the change, and I think Brian said it this morning, three years ago, he'd never picture he'd be sitting where he is now, doing what he's doing today. Total change. And that's, I think that's something Fred said too in his testimony, that, that his family noticed the change in him almost before he did. They knew something had happened to him. They knew something had changed in his, in his heart, in his life. His, his drastic has the, the, the caterpillar, that little squiggly thing with all the legs. No, no beauty at all to it. As much as that thing can crawl and slither and then crawl into cocoon and emerge as a beautiful two-winged butterfly, as drastic as that change is, is the change God can work in your life. That's what God can transform you. You, you won't believe, it. if you'll let the Word of God work in your life, listen, you won't believe what you'll be in three years. You won't believe what you'll be doing. Uh, when Danny goes and talks to those prisoners, and he can tell them, you know, uh, 17 years ago, I sat where you sat. I wore that jumpsuit just like you have on. And now look, he's coming in and reaching them with the gospel. He's coming in as a preacher. And, and, and transformed. His life been transformed by Christ. But you know what's done it? That book he's got in his lap right there. You know why? Because I, I know he's up every morning reading that book, studying the Bible. God's transformed his life. He's a new creature. Men, he's come in contact recently with people from high school. You know, back in high school, back in the dark ages. And uh, <laughs> it's not that old, really. And, but you know what? It's an opportunity for them to say, hey, I'm not the Danny I was back then. I'm, I'm somebody different now. And he tells them about Jesus. That's why I mentioned earlier about being transformed. The other night at prison, I think somebody said that uh, the, the Bible, B-I-B-L-E, you know, they, they say, oh, that's basic instruction before leaving earth. B-I-B-L-E, you know. Here's, here's, the, here's the problem or basic information or something before leaving earth. The Bible instruction, it's, it's not just for instruction, you know. It's not just for information. It's for transformation. You don't just read the Bible to, to know something. Knowledge puffs up. Knowledge just gives you a big head. God never, God never blesses anyone for the Bible they know. God blesses you for the Bible you live. He blesses your obedience to the Bible. So they were biblical. And, you, and sometimes people say, well, every, you know, because churches advertise we're Bible believing. They say, well, all churches are, aren't they? No. 
I wish I could say yes, but, but, but it's not honest. Uh, and, and so we believe the Word of God. Everything, every word, every word we believe in this book. Okay, so you need to know it's biblical. So they're saved, they're converted, they're biblical. Number four, notice again in verse number nine of chapter one, they were devoted. We, we talked about verse nine again, how they turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. Oh, they went from serving idols to serving God. They were devoted to serving Jesus Christ. Man, we need a fresh dose of of serving Jesus Christ in our churches. Hey, we need a fresh dose of people who say, I'll serve the Lord with gladness. Oh, what a, what a joy last night to, to dismiss and, and then people just stayed, just stayed and cleaned everything up. And I mean, to walk into that fellowship hall this morning and you couldn't tell anything happened there last night. Everything is set up for children's church. The kitchen was absolutely spotless. I don't know who did that, but it was incredible. And uh, everything just put in place. And you could tell, you know what? Somebody here just serves the Lord. Just wants to help. And I appreciate all those who did that. And I mean, people who are happy in the service of the King. That's what it's all about. Who, who is happy serving the Lord? When you're, <clears throat> when you're happy in the service of the King, you look forward to it. You're, you're, you're anticipating it. Now notice they went from idols... To God. What they used to do for their idols, they now want to devote that to God. People love to tailgate in Columbus, Ohio. Hmm? Football season isn't far away. And, and, and for some, it's an all-day thing. I mean, they'll, they'll be at their place in the parking lot by 8 or 9 in the morning, and <clears throat> they, they somehow have breakfast out there. And then they go ahead and fire up the grill and they have lunch depending on what time the kickoff is and when the game is. And when the game's over, they go back out there again. And oftentimes they'll spend eight or ten hours of their day tailgating. And you know what? They think it's the greatest thing in all the world. And, and you know what? That's, that, if they want to do that, that's fine. But then the same people will grumble and complain because church was longer than an hour and a half. And I say, wait a minute, what's wrong with this picture? Why would you give ten and a half hours to your idol and only give an hour and a half to God and then grumble and complain because it was 12 o'clock till he got us out of there? Wow. We sing the song, let us labor for the master from the dawn till setting sun. But how many of us have ever done that? I was ever labored for the master from the dawn till setting sun, talking of all his wondrous love and care. You see, not many. Not many. Serve idols. They gave hours and hours to the idols, and now they give it to serving God. Are you devoted to serving Jesus Christ? saying, whatever you do for God, whatever work you have in the local church, be devoted to that. If you're a Sunday school teacher, be a devoted Sunday school teacher. If you're a choir member, be a devoted choir member. Be dependable. Think, man, Bob, Bob shouldn't, he should never have to wonder, well, I don't know who I'm going to have today. You ought to know that they, these, these folks are not just singing, they're devoted to their, their singing. I appreciate Lisa's devotedness to be at the piano. Her faithfulness. You can tell it makes such a difference when we're devoted to the service of Christ. Serve the Lord with gladness. So they were saved, they were converted, they were biblical, they were devoted. Number five, they were witnessing. Look at verse eight. For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to God were to spread abroad so that we need not to speak anything. From you sounded out the word of the Lord. Oh, they were, they were preaching the gospel, and not only where they were, but it echoed out. That's literally the word, echo. It just echoed out to other places. And other people, it spread abroad that these folks served the Lord, and these folks were telling people about Christ. They knew the importance of spreading their faith. They knew the importance of the Great Commission. The Great Commission is called so because 
four times, actually five times, Jesus gave that commission. Five separate occasions. And when Jesus says something to you five times, I guess it must be important. And so it's called the Great Commission. But I'm, a, I'm fearful that it's become the Great Omission. And we're not getting the job done. We're not getting the gospel out to the ends of the earth. And I'll tell you why. Let me ask you this question. And don't say anything and don't poke anybody and don't just... 168 hours since last Sunday we met. 168 hours have passed. How much time did you give to giving the gospel to somebody else? Wonder why the job isn't getting done? If we're not doing it, who's going to do it? If the people in this room, if the people who say we love Jesus Christ and He saved us, if we're not giving any time to give the gospel to anybody, who's going to give it? Where are they going to hear it? 168 hours God gives us in a week and we can't find one or two to go give the gospel to somebody? You know, if, if I couldn't find two hours out of that week to spend with my wife, she would rather doubt that I cared much for her. If I, if I couldn't find, hey, if you couldn't find two hours a week to work for your employer, you wouldn't have an employer. You wouldn't have a job. But somehow we think that while it wouldn't fly with who I work for and it wouldn't fly with who I'm married to, it's okay with God. Hmm? But it's not okay. They were an example. They were a pattern of sounding out the gospel. Let's, let's take the Great Commission seriously. And we don't, we don't do it with lip service. We have to do it with our time. I think... I think, I don't know if it's out there now. Not that it used to be out there. Uh, you spell love, T-I-M-E, T-I-M-E, time. Okay? Tell God how much you love Him if you never spend any time serving Him. Carrying the gospel to other people. They were witnessing people. Be a witness. Take it everywhere you go. There's people everywhere that need the gospel. So they were saved, this pattern church was converted, they were biblical, they were devoted, they were witnessing, and then number 10, I want you to notice verse 10, they were waiting, they were looking, they were looking. The Bible says they were waiting, wait to wait for His Son from heaven, whom He raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. They're waiting for His Son from heaven. You know what they were expecting? They were expecting the Lord to return. Now later in chapter 4, he told them about that return and what would happen in chapter 4. We talked about this in our Sunday school class. Notice chapter 4 and verse 13 where Paul writes, I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others, which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain under the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. So they were, they were expecting the Lord. They were waiting for the Lord and, and expecting Him to come. They were looking for Him. Hey, there's always an urgency to the message because Jesus could come back. And and And... He's, what's holding Jesus up? He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The Lord's not slack concerning His promise. His promise is that He's returning. He says, I'm not slack on that promise. I'm just giving people as much opportunity as I can to repent and to be saved. So there's a, there's a desire to live holy because Christ could come today. Whenever the New Testament writers wrote of His appearing. They seem to always convey the truth that this could happen imminently. Look, and we don't have time to turn to all the Scriptures today, but just jot them down if you want to look at them later. Colossians 3 and verse 4. 2 Timothy 4 and verse 8. 
1 Peter 5 and verse 4. And 1 John 2 and verse 28. In Titus, Paul tells us, we're to be looking for the blessed hope. And again, hope in the Bible is not like we use hope today. Okay? It's not a cross your fingers and carry a four-leaf clover in your pocket and all that. Hope, hope, hope. That's not what hope is in the Bible. Hope is a sure thing. It's, it's, it's bedrock assurance. It's an absolute thing. It's something you anchor your soul to, the Bible says. And you don't anchor something to something you hope will hold you. You anchor into something you know will hold you. And your anchor, you anchor and you, yet your blessed hope and the glorious appearing. We're, we don't have a, we don't have any hope. Listen, we're not looking for Jesus as a blessed maybe. We're looking as a blessed hope. Amen. And, and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm not, I'm not looking for the reign of Antichrist. I'm looking for the return of Jesus Christ. And that's what I'm looking for. And that's what we're to be looking for. And, and we sing a song. The choir sings a little opener sometimes. Maybe today my Lord will come for me. Maybe today my Savior I shall see. Maybe today from sin I shall be free. Jesus will come. I will go home. It may be today. That's the blessed hope of the believer. But the Bible says every man hath this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. We have to be prepared to meet him. If you don't know him as your Savior, you're not prepared to meet him. You need to trust him as your Savior today. But if you're saved, then you need to be prepared by living a holy life before him and doing his will for your life. Let's, let's be, hey, let's follow the pattern church. Let's, let's be a pattern church like the Thess Thessalonian church was, like these believers were in Thessalonica. Let's, let's be a pattern church. You know, there's a little plaque out there from Reformers Unanimous. And it's a, uh, what they call a premier chapter. What, what they decided to do is that, you know, sometimes with just the, the, the staff they have, they cannot get out to everybody who wants to start a chapter of Reformers Unanimous. And so if there was someone within driving distance of our church, they, they, the, Brother Burks has been to our church and he's, he's watched our U program and, and they, they gave us a plaque that said, you're a premier chapter. You know what that means? They say, you run it just like you're supposed to run it that you run the RU program at your church like we teach you to do it at Rockford. And so they gave us that plaque. So if someone else wants to get started uh, an RU chapter, they would send them to observe our chapter on Friday night on how it's run and say, go do it like they're doing it. Okay? That's what Thessalonica is. It's, it's a premier church. And God is saying, you know what? If you want to do something, let's do it like them. Let's do it like them. And let's be that kind of a pattern church. But you understand it's not the building. It's those of us who are in the building that have to be this way. Let's ask God to help us to do that. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, take the truth now this morning. Thank you for this church at Thessalonica. Lord, we love the church and we love the pattern here that you've given to us of this church in Thessalonica. Thank you, God, for the pattern that they provide for us and I pray, Lord, that each of us would look at that and, and say, God, do that in my heart. Do it in my life. Saved, converted, make sure that I've changed a purpose in my life, that I'm devoted to serving Jesus Christ with my life, that I'm sounding forth the gospel, I'm witnessing to others, that I'm waiting for Jesus to come, that I'm looking for his return, that I'm longing to see Jesus Christ one day. Lord, I pray that you'd make us those kind of people this morning. If any of this room today, Lord, does not know Christ as their Savior, they've never put their faith in him, I pray they trust him as their Savior today. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. I'll finish this prayer in just a moment. But right now, just between you and God, I wonder how many folks in the room today would say, Pastor, if I died today, I know I'd go to heaven.
There's a time in my life when I asked Christ to be my Savior. And I know that if I died, I'm confident I'd wake up in heaven because I'm trusting Jesus as my Savior. Here's my hand as a testimony. Would you hold it up for a minute that I may see it and say, Pastor, I know that I'm saved this morning. All right, you may put it down. You're here today and would say, Pastor, I don't know for sure. If I died, I don't know where I'd spend eternity. I'd like it to be heaven, but I don't have the assurance that it'll be heaven. Would you let me pray for you this morning? Would you slip your hand up and hold it for a minute and I'll say, and say just pray for me this morning, Pastor? All right, thank you. The sermon was to believers today. It was to the church. I wonder how many church members today, how many believers would say, Pastor, the Spirit of God stopped at my seat this morning. He, he spoke to my heart. I appreciate you praying for me today. Would you slip your hand up? Say, pray for me this morning, Pastor. Yes. Amen. Amen. All right, you may put them down. In a moment, I'll pray and we'll have our invitation. God has spoken to your heart this morning. I want you to respond to him. If you're today and you're saved and you've ever been scripturally baptized, you ought to come and say, Preacher, I would need to follow the Lord in baptism. If you're saved and baptized and you believe this is where you ought to belong, and you come and say, Preacher, we want to belong. This is where we want to serve the Lord. Whatever it is, you just need to come and pray. Whatever it is God's dealt with your heart about, you'll obey Him this morning. Father, have your way now in this invitation. Thank you for speaking to our hearts this morning. Thank you, Lord, for decisions that have been made. And I pray, Lord, you'd hear our prayer now as we bow at the altar today. Lord, let us spend a few moments with you before we leave this place and go our separate ways. Lord, I pray that you'll hear our prayer and our cry to you this morning. Have your way in every heart and life, and I'll thank you for it. With your heads bowed, you stand to your feet. As you stand to your feet, our pianist will play. As she plays, Brother Bob's going to sing the invitation. God has spoken to your heart. Respond to him this morning, will you? Lord, have thine own way. Thou art the potter, I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will. While I am waiting, yielded and still. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Search me and try me, Master, today. Whiter than snow, Lord, wash me just now. As in thy presence, humbly I bow. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Wounded and weary, help me, I pray. Power, all oh power, surely is thine. Touch me and heal me, Savior divine. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Hold o'er my being absolute sway. Fill with thy spirit till all shall see Christ only always living in me. All right, go ahead and be seated, if you would, please. Appreciate your attention this morning. A couple decisions today we want to read for you. 
Glad to have Nicodemus Phillips coming. Nicodemus is 10 years of age, and uh, Nicodemus was saved uh, down at Heritage Baptist Church and uh, Canal Winchester, a good uh, church there, and uh, they started coming here several weeks ago, and um, his mom over there, Mimi, is coming for membership this morning. She's been saved and baptized, uh, but Nicodemus wasn't baptized yet, so he wants to be baptized and become a member of the church as well. And so, uh, Nicodemus, congratulations to you. That's great. There he is. Brother Wallace will take you downstairs, and he'll get you all set. We'll get ready to baptize you this morning. Congratulations, young man. That's good. We got Mimi's card. Okay. Thank you. And this is Mimi or Michelle Gust. Okay. She's been saved and scripturally baptized, and she's coming to be a member uh, here at our church. All right. All those in favor of welcoming Mimi into the fellowship of our church, let it be known by an eye, aye. and opposed by like sign. All right. Congratulations, Mimi. That's good. She said, they got to vote on me. I'm nervous about that. And I said, no, <laughs> not a problem. And uh, Mimi, appreciate your faithfulness to, to be here. And uh, just we're excited to be able to serve the Lord with you. Glad you're here. Amen. Amen. All right. We're going to get ready to baptize. And uh, Brother Bob will take it from here. Amen. Well, I tell you, let's go over to 484. It's a song we don't, uh, I don't know that we ever sing it here as a congregation. But uh, a child of the king, four, eight, four. Let's uh, let's sing that together. All right. Once I was clothed in the rugs of my sin, wretched and poor, lost and lonely within. But with wondrous compassion, the King of all kings. In pity and love took me under his wing. Sing that chorus now. Oh, yes, oh, yes, I'm a child of the king. His royal blood and flows from my veins. And I, who was wretched and poor, now can sing. Praise God, praise God, thou my child of the king. Listen to that second now. Now I'm a child with a heavenly home. My holy father has made me his home. And I'm cleansed by his blood, and I'm clothed in his love. And someday I'll sing with the angels above. Oh, yes, oh, yes, I'm a child of the king. His royal blood now flows in my veins. And I, who was wretched and poor, now can sing. Praise God, praise God, I'm a child of the King. Are you glad you're a child of the King this morning? Amen. Let's go to 520. 520. The chorus. We don't sing very often, but I think you all know it. I just keep trusting my Lord as I walk along. I just keep trusting my Lord as I walk along. And he gives us song. Though storm clouds darken the sky or the heavenly trail, I just keep trusting my Lord. He will never fail. He's a faithful friend, such a faithful friend. I can count on him. in the sky or the heavenly trail. I just keep trusting my Lord. He will never fail. Turn your
your page, one more page there, 522. In his time, in his time, he makes all things beautiful. In his time. In his time, in his time, he makes all things beautiful. In his time, Lord, please show me every day as you're teaching me your way that you'll do just what you This is Nicodemus Phillips. Nicodemus, upon a public profession of your faith in Christ as your Savior and in obedience to his command, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, bearing the likeness of Jesus' death and raised in the likeness of Jesus' And the servant said, Master, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. Amen. Let's do one more. 347. Probably just do the first verse of this. Or not. Wow. Kind of like Superman in and out. <laughs> All right. Sorry about that. Get that one next time, huh? Let's stand together, shall we? Amen. Look forward to seeing you this evening. 530 Christian growth class, 630 for the evening service. All right. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for a wonderful morning this morning. I'm sure glad I was in the house of the Lord today. Thank you for each one who was here, Lord. We pray your blessing now as we go our separate ways. Watch over us. Make us mindful of your presence with us, Lord, as we leave this place. May others see Christ in us this week. Give us a good afternoon and bring us back safely uh, for the service yet this evening. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The joy of the Lord is... My strength. Sing it together one more time, Brother Bob. The joy of the Lord is my strength. 
the joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Oh, the joy of the Lord is my strength. I go to Bible Baptist and I love my church. I go to Bible Baptist and I love my church. I go to Bible Baptist and I love my church. Oh, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Amen. You are dismissed. We'll see you tonight.